Hallelujah. Happy Easter, everyone. Happy Easter. And uh, welcome to this uh, service of Easter Sunday here at Christ Church Gloria in Beaconsfield. Uh, it's so great to uh, look out and actually see faces looking back at me after, after so many uh, weeks of uh, just looking at the camera uh, for Sunday services. So it'll take you a little bit of time to get used to uh, seeing people in front of me and also get used to this microphone. So of course, even though we are gathered again, uh, we are not out of the pandemic yet and we still have uh, protocols to follow. So, as you know, you have to wear your mask all through church. Uh, I'm the only one that that's allowed to take it off, but I'm way up here. Uh, also, no singing, no congregational singing. You can hum along or mouth the words behind your mask. Uh, but our, uh, the government's regulations and also the license regulations uh, allow us to have one soloist. So Yevgeny will be singing for us, uh, but she's way back in the back, and she has a, a, a singing mask. On that note, uh, even though we can't sing in, as a congregation right now, uh, many of you have, uh, have contributed to our opening hymn. People recorded their voices at home, and Sylvia compiled them into this uh, wonderful opening hymn that sounds like we're all singing together in this place. So we will stand and listen as we uh, sing in our hearts, Christ, Jesus Christ is risen today.
Alleluia. Christ is risen. The Lord is risen indeed. Alleluia. May his grace and peace be with you. May he fill our hearts with joy. Almighty God, to you all hearts are open, all desires known, and from you no secrets are hidden. Cleanse the thoughts of your hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. Glory to God in the highest, and peace to his people on earth. Lord God, heavenly King, Almighty God and Father, we worship you, we give you thanks, we praise you for your glory. Lord Jesus Christ, only Son of the Father, Lord God, Lamb of God, you take away the sin of the world, have mercy on us. You are seated at the right hand of the Father. Receive our prayer. For you alone are the Holy One. You alone are the Lord. You alone are the Most High, Jesus Christ, and the Holy Spirit, in the glory of God the Father. Amen. Let us pray. Lord of life and power, through the mighty resurrection of your Son, you have overcome the old order of sin and death and have made all things new in him. May we, being dead to sin and alive to you in Jesus Christ, reign with him in glory, who in you and the Holy Spirit is alive, one God, now and forever. Amen. Amen. Please be seated for the readings from Holy Scripture. Our first reading is from Acts chapter 10, verses 34 to 43. Then Peter began to speak to them. I truly understand that God shows no partiality, but in every nation, anyone who fears him and does what is right is acceptable to him. You know the message he sent to the people of Israel, preaching peace by Jesus Christ. He is Lord of all. That message spread throughout Judea, beginning in Galilee, after the baptism that John announced, how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and with power, how he went about doing good and healing all who were oppressed by the devil, for God was with him. We are his witnesses to all that he did both in Judea and in Jerusalem. They put him to death by hanging him on a tree, but God raised him on the third day and allowed him to appear, not to all the people, but to us who were chosen by God as witnesses and who ate and drank with him after he rose from the dead. He commanded us to preach to the people and to testify that he is the one ordained by God as judge of the living and the dead. All the prophets testify about him, that everyone who believes in him receives forgiveness of sins through his name. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Our appointed song for today is Psalm 189, verses 1 to 2, and verses 14 to 24. And I would ask that you respond with those words in, written in bold. Give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. His mercy endures forever. Let Israel now proclaim. His mercy endures forever. The Lord is my strength and my song. There is a sound of exultation and victory in the tents of the righteous. The right hand of the Lord has triumphed. The right hand of the Lord has triumphed. I shall not die but live. The Lord has punished me sorely. Open for me the gates of righteousness. This is the gate of the Lord. He who is righteous may enter. I will give you thank I will give thanks to you, for you have answered me. And have become my salvation. The same stone which the builders rejected. 
This is the Lord's doing. And it is marvelous in our eyes. This is the day the Lord has acted. We will rejoice that we find it. And together we pray. Holy and mighty God, your Son's triumph over sin and death has opened to us the gate of eternal life. Purify our hearts that we may follow where he has gone and share in the radiance of his glory. We ask this for the sake of our risen Lord. Amen. Our second reading for today is from the first letter to the Corinthians, chapter 15, verses 1 to 11. Now I would remind you, brothers and sisters, of the good news that I proclaim to you, which you in turn received, in which also you stand, through which also you were being saved, if you hold firmly to the message that I proclaim to you, unless you come to believe in vain. For I hand it on to you as of first importance of what I in turn had received, that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he was raised on the third day in accordance with the scriptures, and that he appeared to Cyphus, then to the twelve. Then he appeared to more than 500 brothers and sisters at one time, most of whom are still alive, though some have died. Then he appeared to James, then to all the apostles. Last of all, as to one untimely born, he appeared also to me. For I am the least of the apostles, unfit to be called an apostle, because I persecuted the church of God. But by the grace of God, I am what I am, and his grace toward me has not been in vain. On the contrary, I worked harder than any of them, though it was not I, but the grace of God that is with me. Whether then it is I or they, so we proclaim, and so you have come to believe. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Had already been rolled back. 
As they entered the tomb, they saw a young man dressed in a white robe, sitting on the right side, and they were alarmed. But he said to them, Do not be alarmed. You are looking for Jesus of Nazareth, who is crucified. He has been raised. He is not here. Look, there is the place they laid him. But go, tell his disciples and Peter that he is going ahead of you to Galilee. There you will see him just as he told you. So they went out and fled from the tomb, for terror and amazement had seized them, and they said nothing to anyone, for they were afraid. The Gospel of Christ. Praise, Praise to you, Lord, Lord Jesus, Jesus Christ. Christ. In the name of the Holy Trinity, the source of all, the incarnate Word, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. It's uh, such a, a resurrection feeling to look out and see people in the church building uh, when you're so used to not seeing people in the views for such a long time. It's like uh, that, uh, you know, seeing, seeing uh, Jesus alive on Easter morning. As you, if you, as you probably noticed, if you've been following along with uh, our services this year, this year we've mostly been focusing on the Gospel of Mark. And the lectionary goes through a three-year cycle, and it cycles through Matthew, Mark, and Luke. And John's Gospel gets thrown in sporadically. And this liturgical year, it's the focus on Mark. But the lectionary today gives us a choice uh, about which Easter Sunday reading we can use. It's either Mark's account or John's resurrection account. Now some people might find the, the Mark reading that we heard today a bit unsatisfying. And it's true that Mark is not the, the go-to gospel for either the resurrection accounts or the nativity accounts, because he doesn't he doesn't tell us about the nativity of Jesus at all. So in some churches, this morning the congregation will be hearing John's account of the resurrection. Because it makes for a better story. I mean, there's that whole, you know, that whole bit where Mary Magdalene thinks Jesus is the gardener and then she recognizes him. It's, it's, a, really, it's a really lovely moment. But given the way this past year has been, and given the time we're living in now, I felt that Mark's account was particularly appropriate for this year. But the end of Mark's gospel is rather disconcerting. And depending on what version of what version or what translation of the Bible you have, you may have notes about chapter 16 of Mark, which is the last chapter in Mark. And sometimes there's a mention of a longer ending and a shorter ending of Mark. The longer ending goes all the way to verse 20. Today we, we ended at verse 8. And there's a shorter ending which tacks on a few verses to uh, after verse 8. But in general there's a scholarly consensus that, uh, that the verses after verse 8 were added later on by uh, copyists or uh, editors. And that the original ending of Mark was where it ends today, with verse 8. So that leaves us hanging with Mary Magdalene and the two other women fleeing the tomb in terror, too bewildered to even speak to anyone. And that's where it ends. We don't get the famous appearances with the risen Christ. No doubting Thomas poking in Jesus' in Jesus' wounds. No breaking of the bread at Emmaus, and, and not even a fish fry on the beach like we have in John. It's like some one of these artsy French films, it just fades to black in the middle of, of the action, and we're left with, with nothing resolved and lots of uncertainty, only speculating about what happened afterwards. And an ending like that is unsettling. It, if you're like me, you don't like being left in ambiguity. We like closure, and when possible, whenever possible, a happy ending. 
And it's hardly surprising that later editors or scribes felt moved to insert a more reassuring end to Mark's gospel and make it more like the other three gospels in this respect. Because Matthew, Luke, and John, they all tie the story up quite neatly. It's more like a, like a Hollywood film where the good are rewarded, the wicked are punished, love conquers all, and everyone lives happily ever after. It's very satisfying and neat. And the three women, three women uh, who went to the tomb that morning, they were looking for closure. They weren't able to anoint the body of Jesus on the Sabbath, so they came to pay their respects to their beloved teacher, and close the book on this tragic event. And given the ordeal of the crucifixion that they had lived through, that they had witnessed, a happy ending was the furthest from their minds. All they could hope for is the, the closure and comfort provided by the traditional funerary rites. But they would not find closure on that morning nor would they find a clear, happy ending. Not, not yet, at least. At the tomb, they're still in confusion. Even though the young man standing there assures them that all is well, his message of hope does nothing to allay their fears and their bewilderment. Now, I don't think this abrupt ending is because Mark didn't know how the story turned out. Perhaps he felt it was unnecessary. After all, the early church was founded on the belief in the resurrection of Christ. Everyone knew the story. It was the most famous story. It's the one that you don't need to tell. St. Paul, whose writings predate the Gospels, he talks about Christ crucified and Christ raised all the time. So it's something that was very familiar to people. It's rather the earlier parts of Jesus' life, his ministry, his parables, his healings, that were not as well known uh, to the very earliest, earliest Christians. It's also possible that Mark found the task of describing the appearances of the risen Christ to be a daunting one. If we look at how the risen Christ is described in the other Gospels, we realize the challenge of describing an experience you've never witnessed, you've never had before. At some points, the risen Christ seems very much like the pre-resurrection Jesus, eating with his disciples, having physical wounds that can be touched by doubting Thomas, nonetheless, who we'll talk about next Sunday, while at other times he is very different indeed, suddenly appearing in the middle of a locked room, and then disappearing as soon as he has arrived, or being completely recognized, unrecognizable on the road to Emmaus, only to become recognized when he breaks bread. So it's clear that the risen Christ is far more than a, just a reanimated version of the earthly Jesus. He's on an entirely different level of being exalted and glorified. We can liken the post-resurrection witness of Jesus' disciples as something like a mystical experience, something that is absolutely real for those who experience it, experience it something that is powerful and life-changing, yet it's ineffable. You can't describe it with human language. Our human language is just too limited and when we haven't experienced something, it's hard to put it into words. Matthew, Luke, and John try their best to put this life-changing yet indescribable experience into words. But Mark, on the other hand, just leaves it up, leaves it up to our imagination. Perhaps though Mark is, leaves us hanging at the empty tomb on purpose. We can read multiple accounts of the risen Christ appearing to his disciples, but those experiences remain their experiences, the experiences of those people at that time. It's their encounter with the risen
risen Lord. Mark seems to be telling us that what matters is our experiences of Christ, our encounter with the risen Lord. Because anyone can say that they saw the risen Christ, but it only becomes real when we encounter him ourselves. I mentioned at the beginning of my sermon that I chose to preach on Mark's account rather than John's because it seemed appropriate for the times we were living in. We have now lived through a whole year, plus a whole year, plus several weeks, of instability, uncertainty, and upheaval of different kinds. A year ago, we all had our plans laid out for the coming year, our hopes for the year 2020, only to have the rug pulled out from under us and have all our plans and hopes dashed. Over the course of the year, even as we thought the restrictions would last maybe a couple of months, then it became more months, and it went on and on. The restrictions were extended. Lockdowns came back and left and came back. And we began to lose hope of, of a return to normality anytime soon, perhaps if ever. Now that vaccines are being distributed, and as we sit here worshiping in the flesh in the church building, some of us, we have reason, finally, at last, finally have reason to hope. And this feeling of hope can be reinforced by the bursting forth of spring around us. I know it's not a sunny day today, but, but spring is in the process of bursting forth. We can faintly see on the horizon the end of the pandemic, ever so faintly, but we can feel that it's coming. On the other hand, we don't entirely know how soon a definitive end will come, nor do we know what that end will look like. What will society look like? What will our lives look like? What will our social interactions look like? Will we ever even shake hands again? And for us Christians, what will the church look like? What will our parish of Christ Church Beaurepaire look like? What will it look like even when we're completely unrestricted? How will this experience impact our church life? So despite our hope, there are still so many unknowns, so much uncertainty. And uncertainty is something we don't like. I know I surely don't like it. I want to know what's going to happen next, what's coming down the road, and I'm sure lots of you are like that. To be able to anticipate, even if it's something bad, to be able to look down and anticipate. People have different ways of relating to the unknown, but a very common human reaction to the unknown is fear. So it's perfectly understandable the way the women react to the empty tomb. They know that Jesus' body is not there, but yet their natural reaction is fear and confusion. In the face of uncertainty, it's all too easy to fear or assume the worst, to give in to doubt, negativity, or anxiety. While we ignore the voice of hope which is standing right there, the young man dressed in white, he's telling them, he's telling them good news. And that's where we really need to put our focus in this story today. Yes, we don't have appearances of the risen Christ, but we have the young man dressed in white. Now, as a side note, dressed in white would probably ring a bell for early Christians because the white robe, like I'm wearing over here, is the baptismal robe. It's the sign of being baptized. And on some of the other Gospels, instead of a young man dressed in white, they call them angel, their angels there or, or some other figure. But it, it, but it doesn't really matter who he is, whether he's an angel or, or, or what. It's not who he is, but what he says. Do not be alarmed. 
you are looking for Jesus of Nazareth who was crucified. He has been raised. He is not here. In troubled times, it's all too easy to give in to the voice of fear, the voice of doubt, of anxiety. But Mark the Evangelist gives us another alternative. To listen to the voice of the young man dressed in white, as he is the voice of hope. Amen. Let us stand and confess our faith in the words of the Nicene Creed. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, of one being with the Father, through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven. By the power of the Holy Spirit, he became incarnate from the Virgin Mary and was made man. For our sake, he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day, he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father. With the Father and the Son, he is worshipped and glorified. He is spoken to the prophets. We believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come.
and Robbie. And we continue to pray for those who are still grieving, who have lost friends and family and loved ones. And we pray that they, we, they may know your comfort and your loving support. Lord, we lift up to you this world that you have created in love. And we pray that your spirit will move powerfully to bring healing, regeneration, and abundance, that we may once again be faithful stewards of creation. And at this time, I ask for your prayers, for those that are close to you, either quietly or aloud, for the needs of this world, for the cares of this planet. And I invite those prayers now. Lord Jesus, we ask that we may be blessed with your spirit, that it allows us to bring all humanity and all of creation, and that we may lift our voices to you in praise and thanksgiving, always praying and thanking for our blessings in the name of Jesus our Lord. Amen. Dear friends in Christ, God is steadfast in love and infinite in mercy. He welcomes sinners and invites them to his table. Let us confess our sins, confident in God's forgiveness. Most merciful God, we confess that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We are truly sorry and we humbly repent. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us and forgive us, that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your name. Amen. Almighty God, have mercy upon you, pardon you, and deliver you from all your sins, confirm and strengthen you in all goodness, and keep you in eternal life, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. The peace of the Lord be always with you. And also with you. Please share a sign of the peace of Christ in a, in a non-tactile way or in the comment section below the video.
Let us pray. God, our strength and salvation, receive all we offer you this day, and grant that we who have confessed your name and received new life in baptism may live in the joy of the resurrection through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give our thanks and praise. Blessed are you, gracious God, creator of heaven and earth. We give you thanks and praise for the glorious resurrection of your Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. For he is the true Paschal Lamb, who has taken away the sin of the world. By his death he destroyed death, and by his rising to life again he has won for us eternal life. Therefore, joining our voices with the whole company of heaven, we sing our joyful hymn of praise to proclaim the glory of your name. Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. We give thanks to you, Lord our God, for the goodness and love you have made known to us in creation, in calling Israel to be your people, in your word spoken to the prophets, and above all in the word made flesh, Jesus, your Son. For in these last days you sent him to be incarnate from the Virgin Mary, to be the Savior and Redeemer of the world. In him you have delivered us from evil and made us worthy to stand before you. In him you have brought us out of error into truth out of sin into righteousness, out of death into life. On the night he was handed over to suffering and death, a death he freely accepted, our Lord Jesus Christ took bread, and when he had given thanks to you, he broke it and gave it to his disciples and said, Take, eat, this is my body, given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. After supper he took the cup of wine, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them and said, Drink this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for you and for many, for the forgiveness of sins. Whenever you drink it, do this for the remembrance of me. Therefore, Father, according to his command, we remember his death, we proclaim his resurrection, we await his coming in glory. And we offer our sacrifice of praise and thanksgiving to you, Lord of all, presenting to you from your creation this bread and this wine. We pray you, gracious God, to send your Holy Spirit upon these gifts, that they may be the sacrament of the body of Christ and his blood of the new covenant. Unite us to your Son in his sacrifice, that we, made acceptable in him, may be sanctified by the Holy Spirit. In the fullness of time, reconcile all things in Christ, and make them new and bring us to that city of light, where you dwell with all your sons and daughters, through Jesus Christ our Lord, the firstborn of all creation, the head of the church, and the author of our salvation. And by whom and in whom and with whom, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all honor and glory are yours, Almighty Father, now and forever. Amen. And now, as our Savior Christ has taught us, let us pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Lord, we died with you on the cross. Now we are raised to the life. We were buried in your tomb. Now we share in your resurrection. Live in us, that we may live in you. These are the gifts of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Now, uh, it's been a while since we've uh, 
receive communion, I remind you that uh, it's bread only, and I cannot speak while I'm while I'm giving you the bread. So, as you receive, as you receive the bread, hear these words in your heart: the body of Christ given for you. Please follow the uh, the uh, instructions of the ushers, and when you don't take your mask off, but you know, slip under, under, under your mask when you come to the seat.
Let us pray. God of life, bring us to the glory of the resurrection promised in this Easter sacrament. We ask this in the name of Jesus Christ, the risen Lord. Amen. And together we pray. Glory to God, whose power working in us can do infinitely more than we can ask or imagine. Glory to God from generation to generation, in the church and in Christ Jesus, forever and ever. Amen. Please stand for the benediction. May the God of peace, who brought again from the dead our Lord Jesus, the great shepherd of the sheep, by the blood of the eternal covenant, equip you with everything good that you may do his will, working in you that which is pleasing in his sight. Through Jesus Christ, to whom be glory forever and ever. May the blessed God Almighty, God the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit be upon you and remain with you now and forever. Amen. Please be seated. Announcements. Uh, we continue to have coffee fellowship on Zoom because we can't congregate and have coffee fellowship in the church at the moment. Uh, but it will be starting at 11.30, so you have time to get home. And it's not, a, it's not a, you know, be there on time kind of thing. It's, it's come and go as you, as you like. Uh, we're usually there for about 45 minutes to an hour, and it starts at 11.30. Today we have a special treat. Uh, the children, together with St. George's uh, Place de Canada, have put together a video that we're going to, uh, to be showing at the Zoom coffee hour. We can't show, we couldn't show it here because we're broadcasting live on the internet and not everyone wants to be broadcast on, online. So we'll be watching that at coffee hour. And we have some other things to discuss as well. Uh, if you haven't uh, got a palm cross, there's, we still have plenty at the back of the church, I think, uh, that were blessed last Sunday, Palm Sunday. Um, let's see. A word about uh, exiting the church. Please do not congregate in the church, and please wait for the instruction of the ushers about when to leave your pew, because there's a specific order for leaving the church. And I know it's tempting to chat in the narthex, but please go outside. It's not too warm today, but if you if you really want to chat, please do it outside the church doors. Uh, and that's why I will stand outside as well. Uh, because we're under strict regulations and we don't want to, we don't want to get in trouble, we don't want anyone to get sick either. So uh, please uh, be aware that we are, we are back to church, but we're kind of half back. We're not, we're not fully there yet. Uh, thank you for, to Sylvia and to Evgenia for the music, and thank you to all of you who contributed to make that uh, lovely opening hymn, Jesus Christ is Risen Today, possible. It's just so amazing that we could hear our voices blended together. We had, I think, 20-something, uh, around 20, 1920 uh, contributions to that, uh, most from our congregation, but also some family and friends, I think some of my and one of my Georgia relatives sent hers as well. So we're from, we're quite, uh, we're even international. I believe that is all as far as announcements. Donna, did I miss anything? Just follow the arrows below the church, going down the middle. Okay, yes, so, so exit, when you exit, go out along the, su the sides, not down the, the center aisle, so it's like this. Nothing else? I'll just grab the plate from you and put it in the back for anybody that is needing it. Yes, we can't pass the plate uh, uh, during pandemic times, so if you missed uh, the offering plate, uh, it will be at the back uh, as you go out. So I wish you again a very happy Easter, and remember, this the Easter season only begins today, it doesn't end. Uh, this is the first day of Easter. It lasts for 40 days, and we will, God willing, uh, be having in-person worship uh, every Sunday 
until we're told otherwise. Um, and we'll also be broadcasting live uh, every Sunday as well. So usually the, the first Sunday after Easter is kind of a low Sunday where no one comes to church, but uh, I, I ask you to not follow that tradition this year, considering how long we've fasted from, from, uh, from in-person worship. A happy and blessed Easter to you all. And we will stand as we listen to our, our final hymn, Yours Be the Glory, a very typical and uh, upbeat Easter uh, hymn.